happy rainy Friday. Uh, before we talk about uh, a few birds, Piper is here to talk about uh, the computer science department and the SDAs. Thank you, Piper. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, at least for the moment, our last Australian birds to start off today. So first we have the, the masked lapwing, uh, a, a fancy looking uh, uh, bird with these sort of uh, mask flaps hanging down there. Uh, we also have the laughing kookaburra, classic Australian bird. Uh, and finally, the Australian bustard. It's about, uh, here would be about like three feet tall, like puffing itself up to look uh, very, very important. So, what, uh, oh, a few clarifications. Um, so, uh, we'll start uh, doing pair programming, so working on, on the lab assignments in pairs uh, with lab two, and we'll do that for labs two and three, and uh, five, six, and seven. Um, and the final project, you will, uh, so the, the pair programming labs will be assigned partners. Uh, the final project you can do with a partner of your choice or uh, by yourself. Uh, quit, the week two quiz has been posted on Gradescope. Works just the same way as the week one quiz. Minor that it is uh, open notes, open anything linked from the course webpage, and you can attempt it uh, any number of times. Um, in terms of uh, what editor you use uh, for the labs or, or other things in class, uh, I'm using VS Code, but you are free to use uh, any editor uh, that you like. Uh, all right. Any questions about uh, lab one or functions or conditionals uh, to get us started? So uh, one thing that I wanted to, uh, a few things that I wanted to point out about the lab. So you're given this uh, prisoner2.py. There's uh, a comment left at the top for you to put your name, date, uh, what the purpose of this file is. That's true of prisoner3 as well. Uh, there's some uh, code involved with running this prisoner's dilemma uh, simulation, which uh, you can, of course, uh, read through, but you're not expected to, to modify it or, uh, or to understand it necessarily. It involves some, some things in Python that we won't uh, talk about until, until next week. And uh, your task is to add functions, that is, strategies, uh, where it says define strategies here. And that's in both prisoner2.py and prisoner3.py. So just to do a brief uh, bit of background on this prisoner's dilemma, it's this classic problem in this domain of kind of math and economics called game theory, where we pose some situation and the players of this game have different choices they can make. And then the players involved get some reward, some positive or negative value based on the outcome of the game. And this prisoner's dilemma gets its name from imagining a scenario where uh, two people have robbed a bank, they've hidden the money somewhere, the police are on to them and have arrested them. But the police don't have hard evidence. The police can't actually tie them to the crime, but the police put each prisoner in a separate room and tell each one, look, we know you did it. If you tell us, if you give us evidence on your partner, then we will go easy on you. And so then each of these two bank robbers has a decision. Do they stay quiet or do they inform on their, uh, on their fellow robber? And this is a situation where if one of them uh, uh, informs on the other, then they go free, 
and they can keep all the money, and the other one goes to jail. They inform on, inform on each other, they both go to jail. If they both stay quiet, they both go free, but they have to split the money. And so they're faced with this, this decision, and this uh, lab is about these different strategies you're implementing are different ways that uh, the prisoners could behave in terms of whether they cooperate, they stay silent, or whether they defect, whether they uh, inform on, on, their, on their partner. So that's an overview of the lab. There's a specific thing going on here where some of the strategies uh, use information about what has happened so far. Because this prisoner's dilemma is what's called a, uh, in this situation, a repeated game. When we're doing this simulation, there is a hundred, the game is played a hundred times. So we see a uh, hundred times each uh, prisoner can, can co cooperate or defect. And some of these strategies depend on what has happened so far, and that is the purpose of, this, of these histories. They keep track of what has each prisoner done so far uh, in, in the rounds of the game that has been played. And so these history things are something called an object. They're a kind of a way of, of keeping track of, of some information and giving us ways to use that information. And we're going to talk in detail about objects uh, in the second half of the course. So for now, we're going to focus on just how we use these history objects. So one part of uh, the lab is that uh, these history things, they have functions associated with them. So they have things like get length or get num co-ops to get the number of times some, uh, someone has cooperated. And so just like functions that we've seen, to use these specific things, we would put parentheses after them. We would call them like we call a function. But what's different is that these are functions These are functions associated with a specific object. So when we say get length, we mean get the length of a particular history. When we say get the number of cooperations, we want to get the number of cooperations in a particular history. And so we need to tell Python which history we mean when we say get length or get num co-ops. And to do this, we put the history variable in front of our function name. And we separate them with a period. So we would say my history dot get length paren paren. And this would call this get length function for this particular history and return the number of actions that had been recorded in this history. And we could say my history docket length or other history docket length uh, to, to apply this function to, to a specific history. Now if we look at the documentation for our history object. When we look at get length, we see that it has this self thing as its parameter. And we're going to look in detail at what this self thing is, why we need it, when we talk about how to create objects ourselves and dive into those details. 
For now, all we need to know is that Python takes care of this self parameter for us, and we can just ignore it. So we call git length with no parameters. We call git most recent with no parameters. We call git past action with one parameter, with this n. Because again, we're just going to ignore this self thing for now. What are your questions about this? All right, so definitely as uh, you work on the lab, questions come up, post them on the Moodle forums. That's a great place uh, uh, to put, put uh, questions you have about, about any lab that we're, we're currently working on. Um, so how would we write down, how would we use an if statement to check that the length of my history, uh, um, to, to check that it's the first round of the game, to check that there is currently no history. So I'd like you to talk to your neighbor about how you would use an if statement to, to, to check whether we're at the first round of the game, whether there is currently no history. All right, so what can I get a, a suggestion of how we might use this to check whether it's the, the first round? Yes? Yeah. Um, we would use a Boolean saying if my history dot get length uh, equals zero, then it means I have nothing in history, that means it's the first round. Like this? Yeah, got to make sure to use the double equals when I'm testing if two things are equal. Otherwise, Python will get confused and think I'm trying to assign this to zero. And then I would need a, a colon. So if then something that's going to be true or false, my history dot get length returns some number saying, is it equal to zero? If it is, that's true. And I'll do something inside this if statement. Otherwise, I, I will not. Questions on this? Yeah. This might be what we're leading to next, so like, forgive me if that's the case. But like, I, I was able to get that far, but then how do you deal with it being different grounds, like within a single, like, so we went through this pretty quick on Wednesday. Uh, there was something there was something that we could use in combination with an if to like have two different paths that our our program could take. Does anyone remember what that was? Yeah, it was else. So what's the thing that that we want to do when it's when it's zero? And, and what, is, what does our function do when we, when we want it to? Like, how do we have a strategy cooperate, like, in the code? Yeah, we'll have a return. And what is it that we return? Our, our functions return uh, something in double quotes to indicate whether they are cooperating or defecting. Yeah, so if we return C in double quotes, that says cooperate. So now we have code that's okay. If the length of the history is zero, and that's true, we're going to cooperate. And so if we wanted to give the program a different path it could take when this is false, that's when we would have else colon and then indented under the else is what we would want it to do when the history wasn't zero. So uh, uh, when the history wasn't zero, 
maybe then we defect. So this would be a strategy that always cooperates on the first round, otherwise always defects. As after the first round, whenever we checked this length equals zero, it would always be false. There would always be some, there would always be some amount of history, and so we would always end up doing the else. Does that make sense? What are your questions on this? Yes? I guess the problem that I was running into this was like, um, in like the mimic one, for example, when the history like variable is still zero and it keeps calling it like an empty history, like how do you differentiate it? So a history is empty when its length is zero. So we wouldn't want to try and like inside this if get some past action of the history because there are no past actions. Inside this if is when the length is zero. Inside the else is when our length isn't zero is when we could get some past action. So uh, the, the, the way to account for it is to only try and do stuff with past actions in some part of the code where we know the length will be greater than zero, where we know there'll be some, some history. Thank you. Yes? Um, we're getting the past action of a round. Um, for the parameter, if you put in like past action zero, is that the most recent round, or is one the most recent round? Uh, that is interesting question. The documentation should say, and it doesn't. Uh, it should be one. So like one round ago is the past action. Okay. Yes, putting in zero will actually get the round, the action from the very first round. Mm. So putting in, yes, the documentation should say n must be one or greater for it to work. Other questions? All right, let's move on from the lab and do some review. So we will need our cards for this. They're in their usual piles over there. So go and grab one. All right, so I have some code up here uh, that I hope will, will look somewhere somewhat familiar. It's doing a temperature conversion in the other direction from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And so I would like you to think through what order will these lines one through six happen when we run this code? All right, A and B, popular, popular options. Please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about what order these these are going to happen in. Pretty much where we were before. So this gets to one of the first things that I said about functions, which is they separate definition from execution. So we will say that it's B here that these happen in. And that's because we don't do the stuff inside the function. We don't execute the function until we call it. So line one will happen. We have our cur temp variable. Line two will happen. We define this thing called C to F, but we don't actually do the stuff inside it. We're just defining it. Then we skip down to five. And five has a function call, this C to F here. It calls the function, which says, go and do the steps that we wrote down inside the function. Go, do, uh, go to the start of the function, do those steps. 
So then we'll do line three. Then we do line four. And we talked about return sets our, our value for our function call, and it ends the function. Ending the function means go back to wherever you were when you called this function. Oh, okay. So return sends us back to finish line five, and then after that we do line six. So that's where one, two, we define it, we don't execute it, five calls the function, we do the stuff inside of it, and then continue on. All right, what are your questions about this? Yeah. Um, I don't understand why moving line five below line two wouldn't make it a part of the function. So, like, why isn't line five like in like considered one of the steps inside the function? Yeah. So, we the way that Python understands what's inside the function is by the indentation. So only these two lines that we have indented after the after we start a line with def are considered inside the function. And the first line that's unindented marks where the function definition ends. So if line 5 was indented, then it would be considered part of the function. Does that make sense? Yes, but then, what, I'm so sorry, <laughs> wouldn't putting then the unindented one after two make, like, end the definition of the function before the index? So, let me just, uh, so if we had this, and you're s suggesting if we had this here? Um. No, like if we had it after the death. Oh, wait, okay. I like did the same thing. I misread the question. I thought I was asking what the order of the code was going to be in, like not hmm. the order of the execution. So that might be the thing. Oh, yes, that's actually completely what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, that's, I agree. I have often asked what order lines should be in. These lines are in the correct order. We're wondering what 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 are they going to happen in that clarifies uh, my question uh, when when we run the code yeah so there is uh, there's a question like this on the on the quiz it's also asking what order are lines going to happen in yes just a question about that indentation right you said that it recognizes that it's a part of that uh, definition if there's an indent right mm -hmm. can you use as many indents as we want but if I have like, a really long function could I just like, step one then keep on indenting and it would still be part of that function or does it only recognize that first indent so uh, it so you, you can't have lines with just arbitrary indentation mm -hmm. so it will give you a syntax error if um Let's just move this over to VS Code. This is this gets into the next uh, next thing that I or a thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, so, if we say put an extra indent for this return, uh, and we run this. It's going to say an unexpected indent on line four. Okay. So the indenting, uh, now if we indented both of these, I think that would be fine. But just like however much you indent, that has to be consistent for the whole function. Otherwise, okay. Python gets confused. Yes? What's the difference with this great indent? Uh, so an indent. Um, so the, there is not, indent can be composed of spaces. Um, so uh, if we just put these, oops, one space in, 
Python's happy with that. It just needs to be moved in some amount. Now, one space makes the code quite hard to read. Uh, it's hard to tell like what's indented and, and what's not. So typically four spaces uh, is, is what you will see. Yes? So which part of the code is being forced in the calls in line five? Sorry, can you say that again? Which part of the code in line three and four is being recalled? Um, well, I guess it, all, all of line three and all of line four. Is it temp f or? Um, can you say more about your question? I'm not sure what your, because what your question five, is. Um, it, it has curve temp f. It doesn't have just temp f. So. That, yes, I, uh, as we talked about on Wednesday, functions are their own little world. And so line five here says, hey, C to F, do your thing. And C to F says, okay, but, but I need a, an, an input. I need, a, I need to know what temperature I'm converting. And so Line five gives it per temp, which we, we know is 28. That gets given the name temp C inside our, our function, does its math, signs it to temp F, and then we say return temp F. And we take the value of temp F, not the, the label, but the value, and that is what uh, C to F gives back to us there. So, yeah, I was confused about the value. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? <clears throat> so, we saw one potential issue with a function is we have inconsistent indentation. Uh, if we if I had accidentally not indented the return at all, um, then uh, Python is going to complain that I can't have return outside of a function. Return only does something inside of a function because its only role is to set the value of the function call and end the function, neither of which mean anything when we're not inside a function. Another potential problem that, that we might encounter is what if I, I had forgotten to, to tell C to F what temperature I wanted to convert? In this case, I get something called a type error, and Python describes it as this C to F function call is missing one required argument, which is uh, Argument is a, what computer scientists will often call an input to a function, refer to it as an, an argument. And it's saying, look, I was expecting uh, to be given a, a, a temp C. I wasn't given anything. And so I don't understand how to use C to F in the way you're trying to use it. So one thing that we haven't talked about yet is why we would want to use functions. Like we, we've worked on kind of learning what they are, how to put them into Python, all this, all this jazz. But when we went to our weather program and created this F to C function that we used to convert our hot temperature, I'd like you to discuss with your neighbors why or why not would we want to use, say, a function to do this temperature conversion versus doing it the way we did it the first time and just like having the conversion part of this as part of this assignment. So brainstorm a bit with your neighbors about why or why not. All right, what's What's one thought on 
whether benefits or, or drawbacks to functions. Yes. If you're using it a lot, it's and you like have a modification or there's a bug or something, you just have to change it once. Yeah, absolutely. This is a big one that we define a set of steps a single time, and then if oh maybe I want to round this conversion. I just have to change the function in one place to add rounding versus I have done this temperature conversion 16 different places in my code. Now I have to go and change 16 different things. Other, other thoughts? Yes. You simply save space by just, if you can keep calling the function if you want to do it multiple times. Exactly. If we have a function, this function, it's like a single bit of bit of math. But let's say we have a function that involves like 10 steps. Well, either we have to have all 10 every time we want to do it, or we define those 10 steps in one place and then just have the function call. So it can save uh, space. It can make our code easier to understand than having this like complicated 10 steps you know, everywhere that we, we need to do it. Other thoughts? Yes? If you're using it a lot, it's just kind of easier to just have that one line instead of needing to retype or copy it. And it goes on one once. Yeah, absolutely. It, when we have a function, it makes it easy to reuse that uh, we even saw that I can take a function, let's say I defined in temperature.py, and import it into another file. So I might even define a function once for like multiple different projects, and then I can just reuse that same definition in all sorts of different Python files. And uh, making code easy to reuse is a, is a general principle that, that uh, we definitely care about when, when uh, writing software. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree. It's easier to debug, I mean, fix problems, or fewer opportunities to introduce mistakes. If we're only writing the code once, we only have one place uh, to look at it. Many, many times uh, in, uh, in my life, I have copy-pasted code from one place to another and forgotten to change like the one thing that needed to be different between those two. Super easy to do. And so anytime we can just have a function and avoid this sort of copy pasting, uh, it's gonna make, gonna make life better. So I think this is a, a great summary of, of reasons why we want to use functions. Um, functions are, are great. They're very uh, uh, useful tools uh, when we're programming in Python. And uh, perhaps the only reason uh, not to use them is if we have some operation that we only need to do once, then it's a little extra work to make a function for that. And kind of most of these reasons involve, we want to have some set of steps that we want to use multiple times. All right, so I want to make sure that I talk about um, some more uh, more stuff about conditionals because there's there's more there's more to them. Um, so we've seen that we can do uh, an if and an else. We have kind of two different paths that we want the computer to take. But what if we had three different paths? 
that we wanted the computer to take. So one, uh, one thing that we might do is before we had if If our current temperature was greater than our hot temperature, we wanted to print the text in red. Otherwise, we printed it normally, but maybe we'd say if the current temperature is greater than our hot temperature minus 5, so if it's close to the hot temperature, We want to print it in yellow. Otherwise, we print it in, uh, uh, in, a, in the normal color. So these lines that I've written with print are not uh, are not uh, valid Python. They're just uh, comments describing what we would do. Yes. Can, for the second one, the else and then if, could you just do an, an LF there too? Yes, so you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> we have this, this else, and then we have another if, and this is for three different cases. So what if we had like four different paths we want to take? Well, then inside this else, we'd need another if, and then five, we need another if, and then get more and more kind of jumbled and indented. And so... We can do exactly uh, exactly this. Python lets us smush this else and if together to say L if. And so now we have this kind of nice three three way branch, kind of three different paths we could take. We start off at the if. If the condition is true, we go inside here, and then we're done. We get here, and this first condition is false. Then we go to the LF, check if this condition is true. If it is, we print yellow, and then we're done. If the first condition is false and the second condition is false, then we do the thing in the else. And so the, the, the two important takeaways here so we only check this elif when the, the previous condition is false. And we can have any number of LFs between an if and an else. So that could be zero. We could have just an if and an else. Or we can have if, LF, 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 else. We could even leave the else off. So after an if, we could have any number of, of LFs, and we only check a given LF if all the previous ones have, have been false. Does this make sense? What are your what are your questions about LF? All right. Let's do a bit of LF practice then. So this is asking what's going to be printed. I've defined a function uh, that uses uh, the remainder operator to check if a number is even. And then I have an if LF else. I'm wondering what is going to be printed out. So take 
uh, a minute and, and think through what will happen when we run this code. All right. Most people think it's time, but discuss with your neighbor how you're thinking about what this code will do. So, indeed, the majority has this one correct. So, we can start off by looking at our, our, first, our first if. Turns equals equals zero. Will that be true? No, we can see turns equals seven, so it's not going to equal zero. So we know it's not that one. Then we have this this kind of tricky bit where we call this function with turns as the input. So we know that when we call, we go up and do the steps inside the function. So this first thing, x percent two, uh, what is what does that mean? Yes. It's asking for whatever x is divided by two. To, it's asking for the remainder of that. Exactly. That when we divide x by two, what's going to be left over? It's either going to be zero left over or one left over. And if the number is odd. There's going to be one left over when we divide by two. If it's even, there's going to be zero left over when we divide by two. So we do seven divided by two. There's one left over. One equals equals zero. That will be false. So this then will re this will return false, and we will not go into this this elif, which leads us to to do the thing inside the else. Questions on this? Just to check, mm -hmm. if you return the x modulo 2 equals equals 0, that's returning a boolean, right? It's returning the result of that check. That, that's, that's right. That when we, we can, so far we had seen these boolean values, and, and I mentioned, I had mentioned this, this term before. This is what we call things that are either true or false. I, I should have mentioned this comes from, A 19th century mathematician named George Boole. This was before computers, but he thought a lot about how do you do kind of math with things that are true and false. And so when computers started having these like true and false things, they called them Booleans. That's, that's where that sort of weird name comes from. Um, so yes, we can use these boolean these true false values just like we can use numbers so we can return them we can provide them as as inputs to functions all of that good stuff so yes we take x mod 2 x remainder 2 compare it to zero return true or false other questions about this yes so just to clarify in line six uh we don't have to define like if true. It just assumes that if it's true, it'll do it, and if it's false, it's going to move on. Uh, yes. You 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 mean we wouldn't need to do something like this? Uh, yes. So uh, this is uh, a particular. Um, so whenever we're working with Booleans, we will never have a situation where we ever need to write equals equals true. Because if this thing on the left is true, then equals equals true will be true. This thing is on the left is false, equals equals true will be false. So this equals equals true will just give us the same thing as if we did not have it. Same as does not equal false. That also will, will not change the value at all. Uh, yeah, we will just use the true and false value directly. So false, what if we wanted uh, something to be executed if it was false? 
So that's an excellent question. What if we wanted to say uh, it was not even? In this case, we would say elif not is even. So we can use the, the word not, special word in Python, to mean you know the opposite of whatever thing comes after it. So this is this is how uh, we would uh, uh, like to write if this something is false. Does not says not true is false. Not false is true. So it just like flips whatever whatever comes after it. We have a couple other words like this that we can use with booleans. Uh, we might want to say, uh, like in our in our weather app, we might want to say, is it hot and is it raining? So for that, we have and and or as these special uh, uh, operators we can use to combine our true and false true and false values. So we can say if for temp greater than hot temp and chance of rain. greater than 0 0.5. Say chance of rain was some, some number giving us the, the likelihood of rain. And so, and, A and B, is this, you can't see this? Oh, I mean, I can see it. Oh, okay. A sure, go ahead. Um, what if you do, like, if A and B equal, like, one value? Is that something you can do? Like, if A and B both equal X? Um, yes. So, so just to, to, to finish this, when we say A and B, this whole thing will be true only when both A and B are true. Mm -hmm. So how would we say... If we have two, two variables, A and B, we want them both to equal some, some number. Uh, we could say if A equals X and B equals X. Now both of these conditions need to be true. We also have A or B. A or B, the whole thing is true when either A or B or both are true. So kind of just how we would speak logically in English, which is uh, uh, nice that when we say A and B, we mean both things have to be true. When we say A or B, we mean one of them or both has to be true. What are your questions on this? All right, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, look forward to more practice with all this stuff on Monday. Keep working on lab one, post questions on the forums, and have a good weekend.